Hi, this is Lit with Chris, and in this video, I will be exploring the context that you need to know when reading Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis. Persepolis is a coming of age story set in the 1980s in a country called Iran. This means that there's a number of political, religious, and social issues, all of which are being dealt with and understood through the perspective of a young girl. Whilst a fascinating insight in what it's like to live through a revolution, a war, and be able to escape it all, there are certain background information that is alluded to in the book that might need further explanation in order for us to understand how it affected Marjan's childhood. Therefore, in this video, I will attempt to outline the important background information that you need to know to thoroughly enjoy this brilliant graphic novel. Starting in the second chapter, the first political force we come across in the book is Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, the last Shah of Iran. Shah, in this case, refers to the monarch, or the king, who rules Iran. From the outset, the Shah is portrayed as an individual who is unpopular with the general public, owing to his overly westernised outlook and capitalist tendencies. Many of his critics decried the lack of religious morals in the ancient country, as well as the soaring amounts of poverty and illiteracy amongst the working classes. The early chapters of the book chart the Shah's downfall and history of profligate leadership and grandiose exhibitions of power. The Shah is criticised through the lens of Marjan's socialist upbringing. Her mother and father are among many of the citizens that dislike the Shah's abandonment of traditional Persian culture in favour of those that resembled European countries or the United States of America. However, Despite the obvious criticism that a left-wing family such as the Satrapis would have for such a hierarchical and deeply divided society, there was also a common feeling across all sections of Iranian society. Although the main agents in his removal were religious groups and left-wing activists, Satrapi depicts the Shah's unpopularity to be almost ubiquitous. As the book and Marjan details, the Shah is soon forced into exile due to constant and increasingly violent demonstrations from citizens inside and outside Tehran. Whilst many were in jubilant mood and elated for what Iran could become, many now look back on the Shah's time and note the positive impact that he had on women's rights and access to education for middle and lower middle class students these civil liberties would quickly become eroded in the years to come after the Shah's departure to Switzerland and the rise of the Ayatollah. With the Shah's departure came the rise of Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. Khomeini was a cleric who led the Iranian revolution that finally deposed the Shah in 1979. He was a charismatic leader that painted himself and a return to more traditional Islamic values as a potential saviour for the Iranian way of life. Once again, due to Marjan's relatively limited outlook as a youngster, we are only given a limited perspective of what the new Islamic Republic's rise to power consisted of. But we are told via a conversation with her father and uncle that over 99% of the electorate voted in favour of Khomeini's party. This alarms Marjan's father, who seems pessimistic about the possibility of there being a stable sense of life under such an obviously corrupt system of election. Uncle Anoush seems more positive and claims that running a country as a theocracy will require the intellectual support that he and his fellow left-wing activists can provide. At this point, Anoush is right to be positive. He and a number of other left-wing activists have been freed from prison or returned from exile thanks to the Shah's removal. They have great ambitions to restore the ancient and cultured country of Iran to pride of place within the region after years of war, foreign manipulation and puppet monarchies. Sadly, this does not come to pass. Under Khomeini's rule, political dissidents such as Uncle Anoush are rounded up, imprisoned and executed. Thus begins a transformation of the country that few foresaw or desired when the Shah was forced 
into abdicating the throne. Khomeini and the Islamic Republic went about establishing a government based on fundamentalist interpretations of Islam, otherwise known as a theocracy. This meant that women's civil liberties were quickly eroded, non-Islamist newspapers were closed, vices such as alcohol and western goods were outlawed, and many of the nation's schools were closed for re-evaluation of the curriculum and teaching staff. Democracy was outlawed as an approach to government, owing to its ties with western culture. In just a few short months, Iran had traded the decadent ways of the Shah for an austere and controlling government that ruled with intimidation and mercilessness. Conflicts involving the veil, parties, western goods and the death of those close to them help readers to understand the deeply fractious existence a teenage Marjan and her family experienced at a time in her life already associated with confusion and complexity. Many chose to flee the country as a result of the Islamic fundamentalism that had taken hold following the Shah's departure. Those who stayed, such as the Satrapis, feared that their standing in society would plummet if they were forced to emigrate to France, the UK or other European states. However, the outbreak of war between Iran and their neighbour Iraq would prove to be a useful catalyst for nationalism and a distraction from the Ayatollah's harsh style of rule. Marjan herself points out the immediate sense of patriotism she has once the bombs begin to drop. Similarly, her father, a staunch critic of the regime, shows his support for each new victory, given the very real possibility of their family being killed in the crossfire. This war, which was to last nearly a decade, was fuelled by disputes over the two countries' shared border, as well as attempts to provoke respective Muslim groups in each country. Over 90% of Iran's citizenship are considered Shia Muslim, whereas Iraq's dominant faith following is that of Sunni. Despite their similarities, Sunni and Shia Muslims have major disagreements at the core of the faith, most notably who was the right successor to the Prophet Muhammad's leadership of the religion. As such, both the Ayatollah in Iran and Saddam Hussein in Iraq appeal to the minority group of Muslims in the respective neighbouring country as a way to unsettle the region and gain intelligence as to the military goings on. Although the war was an opportunity to settle old scores in an international sense, it also offered Iran's Islamic Republic an opportunity to distract from the political transformations at home. Although the formidable guardians of the revolution were still out in force, families such as the Satrapis were far more focused on the immediate threat to their lives that each new bombing could cause. Hence, political demonstrations and even parties were put on hold while citizens weathered the storm. Hence, not only was their attention distracted from the civil liberties being eroded in the country, the conflict actually boosted support for the government whenever a significant victory was won. Sadly, as the graphic novel depicts, this was often at the cost of many thousands of working class people's lives. Young men who were most likely illiterate or poorly educated owing to their background are shown to be manipulated into joining the war effort with promises of religious glorification in the afterlife. These boys were not even offered the protection of a firearm in some cases and instead were used as a brutal method of detecting and destroying Iraqi landmines on the battlefield. Such a revelation throws Marjan's perceptions into total disarray. By the end of the first book, she seems completely detached from the monarchy she grew up with, the revolution her family fought for, and patriotism for a region that goes back thousands of years. The best thing that Persepolis as a book has to offer us is the opportunity to experience what the Iranian revolution and the war between Iran and Iraq was truly like without our own respective country's media biases 
getting in the way. We come to see that the Shah, the Ayatollah and the war are deeply complicated elements of Iranian life and culture during this time and cannot be separated in simple terms in terms of which ones were beneficial and which ones were damaging to the people of Iran. Instead, we experience them through the curious but limited perspective of a young girl who is trying to come to terms with her religious, national and cultural identity at the same time as dealing with all the challenges that teenage life can bring. Satrapi's protagonist cannot be truly said to be thoroughly criticising or lauding any of these elements of her past. Instead, she gives us a very thorough idea of what it was like to live with or amongst these issues so that we, as readers of other places and times, can better understand them ourselves. If you found this analysis useful and would like to watch more like it, then be sure to subscribe and like via the buttons below. That's all for this time. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.